Good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we're gonna have a conversation with Ricky, and he's uh, he's up north somewhere in the bitter cold. Uh, Ricky, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. All right, where are you? I, we're in Florida. I think you're in Boston. Yeah, we're so we're Boston based. Awesome, awesome. All right, so Ricky, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, so uh, I own uh, multiple different businesses, all in the real estate space. Um, my first main business is Volney Capital. That's a real estate development company. We do projects ranging from two units up to 50 units. Um, those are either a mix of condo projects or rentals. Uh, we also own about 150 uh, rental units uh, located in and around the Boston area. Um, the other uh, next company I own is V10 Development. That is a larger scale development company founded in 2018. That, pro that company uh, is uh, expertise is large scale permitting and construction. So we've got an 85 unit building under construction currently. Uh, we've got 173 unit fully entitled that we're uh, submitting for our building permit in the next few weeks. Uh, and then we have a 385 unit fully entitled high rise, 21 stories uh, near uh, outside of Boston in Everett near the casino. Um, and then we also just submitted another 240 unit development uh, through V10. So lots of large deals that we're working on and we probably have another four or five large deals through V10. Uh, I own a real estate brokerage, Evo Real Estate Group. We've got about 50 agents. Um, that specialize in new construction. They not only sell my products, but products for about 15 or 20 other developers, uh, as well as any other standard real estate transactions. Um, Volney Management is our management company. We manage 650 uh, rentals and condos. Um, so that was formed about four years ago. Uh, kind of out of the necessity to someone needed to manage our own portfolio and then we realized that there really should be someone managing the buildings we're building. Um, and so we just started hiring ourselves. So kind of uh, completed the whole circle. Um, so now we can find the properties, develop the properties, and then manage them into the future. Awesome. What does your wife think you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, <laughs> So my wife actually works for me. Uh, she oversees the property management, accounting, and and that side of the business. So she's pretty in tune. Okay. Uh, other than the development and stuff, she'll I'll tell her I'm heading to a closing, and she'll be like, "For what?" And I'm, I'll be like, "Oh, we're closing on a uh, 30 unit development site today." She's like, "Which one?" And I'll say the name, and she'll be like, "I haven't even heard of that one." And I'm like, "Yeah, well, we got a lot going on." So <laughs> yeah. my uh, wife. People ask my wife, because I'm a serial entrepreneur, own a few businesses, and they go, what does Josh do? And she's like, I have no clue. <laughs> so I, I think she like just says real, real estate. <laughs> real estate. <laughs> just real estate. Keep it simple. Um, wow, you've got a lot going on. Um, what does a day-to-day -day, you know, life look like for you? Like, what, what, what task are you strategically focused on running multiple companies? So, yeah. So, I think we, I've got a great team in place now. So, you know, I have team members who oversee the Volney Capital small projects. So uh, we have, you know, vice president uh, and then other staff that help oversee those projects, um, as well as my business partner in the brokerage, EJO General Contracting. I met him in 2013. Him and I started the brokerage together with another partner, Ryan Acone. But the three of us, uh, he owns a construction company. So we self-perform all of our own projects. So. Cool. He handles the construction. My team handles everything on that side. So um, really in a management role, same with the management company. We've got two guys that oversee. One does the condo side, one does the rental side. So I'm just kind of overseeing that while my wife does the books. Um, and then V10 is what's really taking up a lot of my time, which is these larger scale projects, which is the newest business that we're working on. And, um, you know, a lot of that is just, uh, you know, the, these projects take, a long, long time. And so it's really just having uh, patience in the long slog to get them through entitlements. Yeah, totally. How in the world did you get your start in this? Like, were you like, were your parents into real estate? Like you grew up swinging hammers on a construction site? Like, how'd you get your, how'd you get your start? No, so I actually, I went to Northeastern University and while I was a senior, I took a class on real estate finance 
Um, and the interesting part is all I had ever known previously to that of what real estate was, was the house I grew up in. And then as I got to college that you could rent an apartment, then my friends became real estate agents. And I was like, oh, I, you could become a real estate agent. And that was kind of the scope of what real estate was. And then I never really thought of it as anything else. And then taking that class opened my eyes to real estate investing in all different fashions, how to analyze deals. So I graduated, I started working at Wellington Management, which is a finance company in Boston. And I kind of made a goal for myself that the, the way the FHA loan structure was is you had to have six months of W-2s before you could get your loan. So I wanted to get a property and own, and own a property within six months of when I started my job. So I, I actually started my job in May and I bought my first three family in December. So literally as soon as I could, uh, could qualify for a loan. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Now you and I, let's just say we had a time machine and we went, we went back to when you were studying real estate finance and uh, you could have a conversation. How old were you then? So 18. 19 or 20. Okay. So we're sitting, having a beer or coffee or whatever with the, the younger Ricky. And you're like, Ricky, this is one thing you need to focus on in the next 20 years or however old you are now. I, I probably uh, guessed too high. But what, what, what advice, what direction would you tell your 20-year-old self? And you're like, this is something you really need to pay attention to. So I guess the one thing that I wish I had shifted towards earlier on and, and this is kind of is these larger projects. Mm -hmm. um, you, I, we spent a lot of years on the entitlements of smaller two to nine unit buildings. Mm -hmm. um, what you quickly realize is yes, the risks are higher on the larger ones, but the returns are significantly higher and they're almost the same amount of time and effort. So in the end, if you, someone told you, it's like, oh, you can uh, you know, do one thing and then do this thing, but one has double the return, of course you would do something that's bigger. So um, I think, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of growth. You know, people would ask me and they'd say like, oh, did you dream of building high rises? No, like I, and I'm, like, I've never been someone who like looks into the future and says, oh, I'm, I want to accomplish this. It's like, I'm more just like steady growth, accomplish one thing, and then things will happen and you'll, and you'll continue to grow in your career. Yeah. Yeah. Mine has always been too far into the future rather than, you know, more in the present. I'm learning that as I get a little bit older is you can, you know, I like big deals just like you. I, I love big deals, but man, um, going risky when you have no base hits, man, that got me into a lot of trouble as a deal maker. What are some things that make you a great deal maker? So kind of give us your best deal ever, worst deal ever. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think our strong suit from our company is, is really sourcing opportunities, right? So we don't buy anything permitted. We don't buy anything, uh, you know, where almost, you know, we we're finding raw land and then we're able to take it through the entitlement process. So our real strength is whether it's me through my network, um, or through the brokerage is sourcing, uh, off market raw land deals, and then we're able to entitle them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so for example, you know, we ended up on our Sky Tower project. We were able to acquire that for a very, you know, very, very low number with a two-year contingency for entitlements. Um, and, you know, it took us almost a year of negotiating with the seller to get him to sign the deal. But we just went back and forth, back and forth, consistent. And we ended up getting that signed. Um, and obviously then we were able to entitle the high rise, another deal that we've worked on, which is 240 units, took us two years of negotiating with the seller to get him to sign. So it's, you know, I think we're, we understand that this isn't a quick, uh, turnaround and that we're patient. Yeah. All right. So some of the best deals you've worked on are these, these deals that take forever. Talk to us about maybe a deal that has gone wild and looking back, what could you have done differently? Yeah, so the I guess the the only deal that we've ever we've always made money on every deal we've ever done. So we've That's never awesome. lost. Um, we do have a deal right now that just finished up where we'll, the profit margin will be very small. I mean, you know, so we'll be making you know five percent, six percent after two years, not significant. I mean, I guess if the money had been in the stock market and it had plummeted right now, the investors will still be up. But um, the what happened on this deal is we looked at a site and we said 
what is the as of right option? Because the seller wouldn't take a contingency. So we said, what's the as of right option? We ran the numbers based on that. And we said, if we were to get approved for the as of right, we could break even or make a couple bucks in this scenario. And so we bought the property. We thought, went through the, went through the journey. We thought we would, would, no matter what, we'd be able to get four to six units on the site. Um, after the, you know, a long, long journey, lots of pushback from the politicians, the community, everyone was anti the project. We ended up at the worst case scenario. So we built, we ended up getting approved for the, as of right, three units with three parking spots. We just sold it last week. Um, and we'll make a small 6%, 5% um, return on, on the investment. But even in that scenario, and I think that's, you know, it's a lesson that there's always risk in this, but you really need to be cautious on what the downside risk is. Like I'm completely comfortable putting up money for architecture engineering, you know, whether it's, you know, 20 to, you know, a hundred thousand uh, on an entitlement project that can make millions. Right. But what you don't want to have happen, and this is where people really fall is buy a property that's worth like 400 and pay a million and then not get approved or have someone sue you. Right. And then you're underwater 600,000. Right. So I think, you know, contingencies are, are vital. So what does as of right explain what that is? So an as of right project is when you follow the zoning codes for that area. So in uh, that example I was talking about, the lot size was a 3,000 square foot lot. The floor to area ratio, right, FAR, was a one. So if anyone who doesn't understand how that works, floor to area ratio is equal to the size of the lot times the number. So if it's a one on a 3,000, you can build a 3,000 square foot building. If it's a two, you could build 6,000. So in this scenario, we could build a, uh, a, a building with 3,000 square feet and we could build up to 35 feet tall. We had setbacks that we had to, to follow. And then we had to do one park in that size, we had to do one parking spot. So by completing all of those, it became an as of right option. In Boston, that's very rare. Almost everything that you propose needs a variance. Okay. Now, um, as you're as you're looking at a property, what are some things that you look for to make it a good deal for you? And what are some red flags where you'll go, heck no, I'm out? So I guess from the standpoint of what we're, what we're really looking for is we try to do a deep dive before we move into any deal on the, you know, where it's located, what the zoning is, what the worst case scenario is. Is there precedence in the area for, for this type of project? Um, and, you know, so that allows us to get into deals that, you know, have a, the best opportunity of approval, mm -hmm. right? Because that's in this, in this industry, it really is all about pipeline. And if you can get more than 50 to 70% of your projects approved, you are, you're in a great spot, right? Because the profit margins are so large through entitlements. Um, so that's, I think, the, the main key. Um, what we've really looked to avoid is uh, trying to do density in areas surrounded by single families or in, you know, areas that are zoned for singles or twos. Right? It's just, we did that in the past. It just ends up being such a long slog and a grind that now we're really looking for, uh, for, for properties located more on major corridors where there's more appetite for larger scale projects. Yeah, yeah. Um, entitlement deals, right? What, what is, how did you end up into this? Cause you got, you know, commercial, you, you started in real estate, you, you bought your first, you know, multifamily, you, you know, six months on the job and, and here you are doing, you know, big buildings, condominiums, large projects, entitlement, you know, like talk to us about how you got into that space from where you were. Yeah. So I'll kind of just run you through. So originally the, I, I had no intent of doing this, right? So it was, I was going to buy rental properties as an additional income to my finance job. So after buying three rental buildings, I actually ended up having to pivot into doing condo conversions because the market in Boston had increased it, it, to a point where what people were paying for multifamilies in my, for, for me personally, it wasn't cash flowing enough, right? So I wasn't 
comfortable with the returns. Mm -hmm. And the, what was happening is those investors, they knew the market was about to take off, which is what I knew, but the, they were willing to lose money every year early on for the future value of appreciation. I'm as a new investor, I can't be losing money. I'll never, one, I'll never get the loan. And two, the, uh, you know, I, I just wouldn't have the cash flow to support it. Right. And so at that time, I, I, that's what opened my eyes and looking and say, so what, what's a condo conversion? They've been happening all over other areas of the city, but they hadn't been happening where I was, my main investment was, which was in East Boston. And so we decided to, you know, buy a three family and do condos. And that's so kind of forced by the pivoting of the market. Um, through meeting my attorney, he was a zoning attorney in East Boston. He and I started talking and, and it ended up coming up of what this whole concept was of entitlements and, ha and how to permit stuff. And, uh, you know, we started small and, you know, we did, we took a, uh, a two family and turned it into a four family. Um, and then it just grew from there. Super cool. All right. So I just did a, a quick search. Now this is completely off topic, but let's have some fun. Mm -hmm. Mark Wahlberg, right? Chris Evans, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck, Uma Thurman, uh, Eli Roth. There's a, there's a bunch of actors who are from Boston. If you could be in any movie with any one of those actors, who would you want to go and do a movie with? Um, I have to say Matt Damon. Matt Damon. What kind of movie? All right. So me, you and Matt Damon are going to do a movie together. What kind of movie are we going to create? Action, drama, romance? Like what, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, I think we would have to get into some type of action movie with him. Um, so we'll go, we'll go with a, we'll, we'll go with an action flick. Yeah. With one of your condos in the background and he's like rappelling down the side and you and I are, are his teammates. Exactly. All right. I like it. I'll, I'll, you're, uh, no, you're the villain. You're the villain. Why am I the villain? You have a villain look to you. <laughs> it's the hat. It's the hat <laughs> and, the, and the old guy t shirt. So, um, all right. So, so we're going to do this movie. I'll text, I'll text Matt later on and, and let him know we're going to do this. Um, so as you're in, in Boston, you know, building this stuff, what does, what does the future look like, you know, for Ricky and, and your family and your business? Like what, how do you know you're winning? What direction do you guys want to go? Yeah. I mean, I think it's to continue to uh, progress the business and grow as we've, as we have since 2010 um, and, you know, to continue to deliver high quality rental buildings and, and, and condo buildings to, to Massachusetts. Um, and as well as the other businesses looking to continuously uh, expand. I think the, the management business can really take off. I mean, I think we're 650 units now. I'd like to see that into the thousand to 1500 units in the next year. Um, so that's kind of a goal I've set for the team. So um, really just, uh, you know, continuing to progress. Got it. Mindset wise, go back and you know, you're, you're, you just signed up for a real estate uh, finance course mindset then, and some of the challenges you were fake, uh, facing in terms of mindset towards now, what's different? Um, I would say then the distraction was how many beers I can drink that night and <laughs> get out of bed the next day. Right. Yeah. Uh, now it's, uh, you know, juggling all these balls and, you know, while still I have two children, um, you know, family is very important to me. So I want to be able to, you know, trying to balance both spending time with the family and the kids with all the businesses. So I think, you know, one was the draw was to socializing and partying and going out back then. And I think now it's trying to do a little bit of everything, but still, you know, set, you know, setting time aside for each. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. When I was in, in colleges, yeah. How many beers can I have now? It's like, man, how soon can I get to bed? <laughs> if my kids yeah. go to bed at eight o'clock, it's the victory and wife and I get to have a glass of wine afterwards. Like that was a champion night, you know? Oh, for sure. I, now it's like, now I'm sitting there having drinks and I'm, and it's not like, Oh, I can't wait to drink another 10 of these. It's like, I can't even imagine how hungover I'm going to be after these two tequilas. <laughs> oh, what kind of tequila do you like? Um, so Casamigos, uh, Casa Azul. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Mostly Mezcal. Yeah. One of my favorite go-tos is uh, Milagro. I just mm -hmm. think they taste so good. It's not too expensive. What's the one... 
what's the one that has the bell on the top of the bottle? It's like, you know, that one's pretty good. Is that the one you like? Yeah. Yeah. We just, uh, I brought one of those bottles home there. It's only, only it, it's super expensive compared to like a Milagro or entry, but it tastes so good. I'm a huge fan. Yeah. So smooth. smooth. So next time we get together, we'll, we'll have a, a, a glass of that. How do you, how do you prefer ice salted? How do you like it? Yeah, uh, on uh, just on the one rock. Um, but no, for everyone listening. So this is a little story. So we went out to we went out to a dinner. Me, my business partner, and another developer. And he came in all excited and fired up. And he's like, "Let's get some let's get some drinks, guys." And we're like, "Okay." He's like, I, "The other night I was drinking Casa Azul," and I was like, "He's he's like, let's do some glasses of Casa Azul on the rocks." And I was like, "Yeah, I mean, I'm down." He orders around and so we we you know we drink them and then i was like he goes to order another round and i was like hey man like i don't want to like be cheap but i just want to like casa azul a glass of casa azul at this this type of restaurant can be a lot of money he's it's like 30 nah. bucks a glass he's like he's like no no he's like it, can, it will be he thought he thought it would be like 27 to 30. yeah and i was like i was like ah dude at a place like this it could be much higher orders another round he goes to order a third round and I stop the waitress. And I say, before we put that order in, can you tell me how much those are per glass? $90. Oh. Glass. Oh. So we'd, we were already $600 in before we'd ordered apps. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I know I could have a, I could, I could just close a great deal and I'll go and I'll be like, Hey, give me, you know, the 18 or the 21 or whatever. But even, even if I just closed a big deal and I got a pocket full of cash, I still go, I would like to see the price list on that because I've done that before. I've ordered a drink and I was like, what, 50, 90 bucks? Yeah. I didn't even taste it. I just shot it. I'm like, yeah. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think I could be a billionaire and I'll still go, I need to see a price list before we do this, man. Uh, um, that's so funny, man. Have you ever, uh, <laughs> we used to do this in the real estate game is we everybody would go around and we'd order and then someone would take off their hat and everybody throw their credit cards, credit card roulette, yeah. whoever the waitress or waiter or whatever, they would pull it out. Whoever gets their card picked would be the one to pay. Did you ever do something like that? Yeah, we've done that this night though. I just told him, Hey buddy, you're paying. <laughs> <laughs> you're the big baller who wants yeah, to order $90. All the glasses. <laughs> all right. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, so as, as you're building this out, you got, bunch of different companies, one, two, three, four, all in real estate. How'd you come up with the name Volney? What, where's that from? Yeah. So it's, uh, it's actually the town in France where my family originates. Um, so a lot of people think it's my last name. So people call me Ricky Volney. It's, it's not. And, uh, the, it's the town in France where my family's from. Interesting fact, same town from the Chevrolet family. Oh, so maybe Beliveau and Chevrolets were founded in the same town nice um, but uh yeah so it was it was actually back i'd been doing real estate since 2010 under no brand just my own name and then in 2013 into 2014 i was um i was doing a starting to, i had two condo conversions going still working full time but i was actually blogging on bigger pockets throughout the process i was getting a lot of traction like people who were following the the, the posts and bigger pockets had reached out and they're like, Hey, keep it up. You're getting a lot of traction. Um, and so at that point I kind of was like, Oh, I should come up with a brand. I, I spoke to my architect at the time and he was like, Oh, I like thinking of those names. So let's come back together in a week and we'll see what we have for names. And, uh, we both had Volney on the list from our research. So super cool. Uh, it, that's that cleared up the selection and then uh the, you know that was it off to the races got it now you've got a bunch of different companies right if you were to if you were to let's just say a, a tornado came through and wiped all of them away except one which one would you be like this is the one we're going all in I thought you were going to give a little a little merry fuck kill on me you'd be like which one would you <laughs> oprah <laughs> ellen <laughs> Matt Damon. <laughs> Volney Management, Evo Real Estate Group, Volney Capital, Mary <laughs> Pong Kill. Um, <laughs> um, 
I mean, I would say the one that would have to remain would, you know, it's hard to say, but you have to stick with the the Volney Capital. That's the that's the baby that was that was here first. That's the tried and true. So um, I think you'd have to keep keep Volney Capital. Copy, copy. Um, so with that, what does an ideal deal look like for Volney Capital? And you know, who's an ideal partner for you guys? Yeah. So I mean, idea. You know, any. You know, we look at deals based on total project ROI. So you know, that's how we analyze our our, our development deals, at least from a standpoint of condos. Um, from a rental standpoint, obviously, we're looking at it from a return on cost. But um, yeah. So I mean, on a development deal, we're looking for something that we're able to generate a twenty plus. Uh, you know, return total project return. Um, which that can, you know, keep, that can drive us over a hundred X, um, you know, a hundred, hundred percent return. And then it can give our investors somewhere in the, you know, 15 to 50 range, depending on how it performs. Sweet. Yeah, man. Um, so let, let's do this. Let's give your, give you an opportunity to plug, you know, maybe stuff that you're doing on bigger pockets website, um, a way for people, if they're listening and they go, Hey, I like this guy, I like Ricky want to find a way to do a deal. How could people connect with you and do a deal? Yeah. So the easiest way to reach me, you can uh, find me at Ricky Volney on Instagram. So R I C K Y V O L N A Y. Uh, you can also find my website, Volney Capital, um, or you can email me. It's Ricky at volneycapital.com. Copy, copy. So let, let's go back to entitlement because I think that this is going to be a, a, a topic that a lot of people are searching for and, you know, want to know more about. What are some key components in, you know, a, an entitlement project? So you're looking at a piece of raw land and you're looking to scoop that up or a project and you go, here's my three things you need to know about this property for it, it to be a successful entitlement. So here's the, a lot of people ask me that question, right? And the, the, like, I, I like to look at it this way. It's someone, we, me and my, uh, one of my good friends did this on a kind of a podcast. And it was like, if you dropped me into a new city with no contacts and no money, how would I start? Right? Because that's what a lot of your listeners, they're looking at and say, I've never done an entitlement deal. So it's like, throw me into central Florida. And like, what would I do? How would I do go about it? Right? Yeah. So I think- uh, you know, step one is I would start searching online and meet up with local real estate professionals, right? Uh, come in confident, even though you don't have a dime in your pocket, don't let them know that, right? Come in, you are the big swinging dick. You are the man. You are going to do deals in this area. You, you've got big aspirations, you know, and, and go in and meet people, right? So networking. The second thing is people are like, well, then, well, you know, how, how do I even know, right? Well, so almost all these meetings in any of these communities are public. They have to, almost all of them have to be recorded or the minutes are recorded, mm -hmm. right? So you can go on to any, in, into any city hall and ask for the, the previous 10 uh, minutes from the uh, zoning board or the planning board of that community. And I guarantee what you're going to start to see on there is the same attorney's names very repetitively. And you'll see if there was 10 presentations, maybe five or six of them was the same guy. That's the guy you wanna go sit down with, right? Cause he's the guy who knows the most about the area. He's the one who does the most of the entitlements. And so he's the guy that you're gonna to wanna to sit down and use in that community. Cause clearly he's the one with the, with the largest reach um, and we'll have the most information for you. So meet local agents to give you a sense of where, what the, you know, what's available. And cause you'll need them to tell you, you know, help you with what the condos will sell for, what the rents will be and all that. And from the entitlement guidance, find that expert in the area who can help you out with that zoning. Cool. All right. So you find, uh, connect with some real estate agents in the, in the area. What kind of questions are you going to ask them? What kind of questions are you going to ask the attorney to find these kind of good deals? Yeah. So from the standpoint of the real estate agents early on, you're just wanting to, to let them know that you're in the market and that you are going to be looking for opportunities and let them know what you're looking for. Right. So, Hey, I'm looking for raw land, single families, uh, commercial that can be knocked down and it looked like to do a project that's a, either a mixed use or a multifamily. Um, the 
in this business, the, 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 it all starts with the lead, right? So none of, no one can do a real estate deal if there's not an original purchase, right? So yes, everything else goes afterwards, but it's really deal sourcing or getting opportunities to fill the pipeline. And those can come directly from those relationships. So I think it's, it's key to show them that you're real, give them details of what you're looking for, and almost more importantly is be ready and willing to act when they bring you a good deal. Um, good agents don't want to work with investors who pass on good deals because they'll miss out as well, yeah. right? So if it's an off-market opportunity and they, and they bring it to you and you're their choice buyer and you pass or say you don't pass immediately, say you drag it on for three days while you're waiting and researching and then you pass and they miss out, that might be the last time they call you. Right. So when you're getting into this situation, figure out where you're going to be getting your capital, who's going to be your zoning attorney, and be able to act quickly, because that's what's going to uh, make these agents call you before they call others. Cool. So in your scenario, you and I get dropped off with Matt Damon in, in an area that we know nothing about. Uh, Matt Damon goes on and he starts shaking hands, uh, finding local agents. You and I go after you know, the attorneys and you know, the zoning attorneys and capital. All right. What kind of questions are we going to want to ask the zoning attorneys? And then how we find capital? Because we have no money. Matt has all the money, but he's over there playing around. Yeah. How do we go after capital? And how do we, uh, what questions should we ask the attorneys? Yeah. So if you're early on in your career and you're getting into this, so from the asking the zoning attorney, when you sit down, you're going to say, you know, hey, I just moved to this community. Um, I want to know, you know, I, I heard that you're the best. I want to work with you. I'm, I'm looking to get into project entitlements. I, wanna, I wanted to get a sense of, in, in regards to whatever town or city we're talking about, you know, are there certain areas that they are uh, pro-development? Are there areas that they don't want anything to touch? Um, and you know, is there a zoning map that, of things I can look for? Um, and then and the, hopefully they're able to give that to you or give you a link to the city's zoning code. Um, and then you'll be able to take all of that information and then be able to try to make the most educated decision, uh, you know, when the time comes. Mm -hmm. um, if I have no money and I'm getting into one of these deals, you're going to need to find a local partner, right? And so one opportunity would be the zoning attorney probably can make some introductions to you. So you could say, hey, I, you know, I'm new to the area. I'd love to meet some of your, uh, you know, some other investors or developers in the area. Is there anybody that you'd recommend? Go meet with them. Got it, you know, I look at it this way. Money is very easy to come by when it's a good deal, right? So money follows good deals. So if you come across something that's a great opportunity, it will get funded. There will be someone who will partner with you. There will be capital that will come into that, that transaction. So, um, you know, that's, that would be the, the, those two steps. Okay. So now you, you're meeting with some investors and, you know, you're, we're, you and I are, are chatting with them. And, you know, one of the things we say is, hey, we're working on some few deals. We, you know, we're looking for, you know, project entitlements for, in areas of pro-development. And, you know, we're looking to meet local investors. What kind of deals do you like, right? And they'd say, yes, yes, yes. And they tell us the, the exact kind of deals that they like to invest in, right? Do you, at that point, what what would be the next step? Go hunt for the deals, go back to Matt and say, what kind of deals have you drummed up or what's the next step? Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's continuing those, you know, to continue to build the network in the area, mm -hmm. right? To continue to reach out to additional agents. And this game can't be forced, right? The game, it, this is not a game that you can get into and think you're going to just be like, this is the stupidest thing I hear people say that are like, they're like, I'm, I want to do, I want to find, I'm going to get five deals in the next month, right? And it's not whether it's five or 10 or three. That's not how this works, right? It's like deal like to find an actual opportunity that's worth the investment. You, ha you have to be patient. So like people are like, oh, what's your goal? How many, how many transactions are you going to do this year? I'm like, I'll do zero or I'll do a thousand, right? It, it really depends on how many good opportunities come. I'm never going to say no to a good deal. And if, um, you know, but I'm also going to, I get, if, of everything that gets brought to me, we probably pass on 95% of them. Um, so, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, the way to look at it. 
So you said one of the dumbest things you hear is when people are like, hey, I'm going to do five deals this month and they've never done a deal in their life, right? And you're like, dude, what do you have to base that on, right? Exactly. Don't, you, you can't, the term deal, right, really means that it's not just a piece of junk, right? You're trying to find something that's profitable and that's under market value. Those aren't just sitting out there. If they were, they would, they, they would be snatched up already by the market. So it's not as easy as just like going on MLS and finding something that's been listed and buying it. And that, you know, and let, you know, don't, I don't want to knock MLS. There's our opportunities for stuff that's on MLS. That's, you know, you could scroll through MLS and see a single family for sale and no one else is looking at it because it's a single family, but I might look at it and say, well, that lot actually could support four units. Right. So there's, you know, and the, and the agent didn't even know that. So the agent didn't even market it to developers. He just listed it as a single family. So that there are opportunities in that, in that way. Um, so. Yeah. I love this. I love this. We sh we should, we should do that one day, Ricky, we should go to an area with Matt where we don't know anybody and run this scenario through and see how fast we can get <laughs> a deal on deck. And, and well, what that. was the what was the show it was um was it undercover billionaire yeah that's it was kind of the same concept they just had to start a business that was worth a million dollars in 90 days yeah that'd so, be fun do you think we yeah. could do that do you think you could pull it off not that quickly i i oh could i make a business that's worth a, like they did that's make that's worth a million in 90 days yes not in real estate what would you all right so you and i are hanging out and we got some extra time and we want to start a business that we think would would turn a million in 90 days. What kind of business would you want to build like immediately with me? Oh boy. That's um I don't know, it's it'd be there, there you'd have to get into the into the marketplace and kind of see what what people need and what's available and you know um you know how what you know what what's missing um, and who you can partner with, right? I mean in the end it's going to anytime you're going to be successful in that in that situation, you need a partner because you have zero money and, and you need capital. So who's going to be your partner? Uh, it's very easy to make a million dollar business when you partner up with a guy who's worth a hundred million. You could form, you could quickly set up, get a, a business together that's worth over a million. All so right. I think it's, you know, finding the right partner and then off to the races. If I picked up your phone right now and I searched through your most common songs that you play, what would be like the for, for the past 20 years, what are some of the ones that come up as your favorite songs, your go-to songs? Well, right now it would be Wheels on the Bus. Yeah, and, and, solid um, song. This Land is Your Land. Um, <laughs> these are the <laughs> stupid songs that I listen to. Um, no, but uh, I, I, I'm, I like music, not, not like crazily into music. I like um, like Slightly Stupid, Stick Figure, um, those type of reggae bands. Um, but yeah, country music, a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. What's your favorite uh, like food type? So Boston's known for donuts and some really good food. Like what, what's, a, like what's a good go-to place when I come visit in, in Boston? What's a good go-to place that you just love? Yeah, so I mean, if I'm doing just a dinner out, I would go to Abe and Louie's, which is a you know, steakhouse that's been in the city f forever located right on Boylston Street and, you know, great sides, great steak, great atmosphere. So if you're in the city, you know, great place to go. Cool. During this interview, I, there's probably a question that I should have asked you that I completely screwed up and didn't ask you. What is that? How are you so incredibly good looking? Dude, you are a good looking <laughs> dude. Like non, non gay, right? Like, right. I've got a wife. I'm happily married, but dude, you're a good looking guy. See, there how does that happen? <laughs> yeah see i mean that was the question that was what yeah. you meant out of the out of the rivers of volney two <laughs> people fell in love and th yeah. that's how you came to be <laughs> perfect that was a great way to end this um <laughs> one more time how could people connect with you this incredibly good looking dude how do you uh what's a good way to connect with you yeah so you can ricky Vol ricky volney on instagram or ricky at volney capital uh for email Come closer to the mic I, or the, the camera. You got a good mustache, like the foundation that's, of a good mustache. Pure laziness. Yeah. That's. <laughs> can you really grow a thick one? Thick mustache? I can get a decent one going. 
Yeah. yeah. Next time we do an interview together, I want to see the thickest, nastiest mustache ever. Okay. There you go. I'll do the hand, little handlebar. Perfect. Well, that's what we do on the Deal Scout. Is we talk, uh, we talk about deals and deal makers. We get to hear their story and uh, find out, you know, their personality. And um, I find that people do business with people they know, like, and trust. So that's the purpose and mission of the show: is to interview a bunch of different deal makers and and find a way to connect deals and deal makers together. If you and the audience are working on a deal and you'd like to chat about it here on the show, head on over to thedealscout.com, fill out a quick form, maybe get you on the show next. And as always, reach out to our guests and say thank you for your. Or, uh, time on the show. And if you want to do a deal with them, all their contact information will be in the doodly do below. Just click on their links and you'll connect directly to them. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. See you guys.